Hello and welcome. This is the 11th lecture in the Stream Ecology System for the summer of 2020 at SMCM. This lecture will cover allochthonous resources. So if you have looked at the autochthonous resource lecture, you will know that autochthonous resources are produced within the stream. Allochthonous resources then must be things produced outside of the stream. And when you're done with this lecture, I'd like you to be able to do these things. One of the important elements here is to explain what allochthonous resources are, of course, and explain the importance of them to the stream and to the stream ecology in general. So what does the name mean? So again, these are materials that are formed outside the region where that stream is located so that you can think of that as anything that's not under the water. And in general, as we mentioned in the, uh, the autochthonous lecture, this is a fairly straightforward process. This has a lot to do with terrestrial plants, although there are a number of other very important sources of energy that enter the stream from outside of the stream that we're gonna cover as well. One of the difficulties here again is how do you actually classify things? And I wanna stress that these are all conceptual models. They're all wrong at some level. We're making artificial boxes so that we can understand the systems. However, there's still information to be gained by using these boxes, so we will. So for instance, algae that is grown from nutrients that come from the land, right, and that are liberated by, let's say, the breakdown of leaves are still considered autochthonous, even though the source and the material that some of the algae is using is allochthonous. We can get down to that level of differentiation. In general, we will talk about uh, whole uh, groups as either autochthonous or allochthonous. This fish in the stream that you're looking at, this is a salmon. Is this fish autochthonous or allochthonous if it comes from, let's say, the ocean? Think about that as we go forward. There are many things inside of a stream. Many of those, uh, the organisms within a stream will also modify what's actually going on. All right, so a lot of things are going to enter the stream and be modified. Especially important will be our friends, the leaves. And leaves are going to be modified by a huge range of critters, not least of which some very, very important insects and also some other macroinvertebrates, including amphipods. I know you don't know what those are yet, but you will in just a short bit. And animals have a really important process then in having allochthonous resources enter the stream, because not only are they going to be modifying them when they enter, but they're going to be bringing them into the food web. So let's start with one of the most obvious and one of the most uh, serious contributors of allochthonous energy to streams, and that is leaves. You may think of leaves as an annoyance if you have to rake them up constantly, but think of the amount of biomass that falls every year from trees in and around streams, and that is an enormous consequence for the total energy budget of streams. All right, let's start with leaves, which are one of the most important members of this allochthonous food source in streams. Leaves are going to enter the system as a whole leaf in general. Once they enter that system, it will uh, be relatively quickly that they will be attacked by a variety of different things. One of the first things that will happen is they'll be colonized by microbes. Those microbes will colonize and then they will be attacked by this group of organisms called shredders, which literally shred the leaf, break it up as they eat it. Those pieces will be broken down into smaller and smaller pieces, which will be consumed by all sorts of different organisms. And then ultimately those pieces will be broken down into what is just DOM, uh, or they'll be uh, sedimented in, as detritus on the bottom of the stream. And they will either be remain in the system sort of as a sediment, or they'll be transported downstream as a DOM or when the, that sediment moves, okay? This happens every year. It happens in relatively quick order, right? So most of the tree leaves fall relatively quickly. The breakdown follows that standard path that you saw in the carbon, the organic carbon lecture. We go from CPOM, coarse particulate organic matter, that being a leaf, to fine particulate organic matter, that being feces and fragments from these shredders, ultimately to DOM, dissolved organic matter, as that material is broken down. Now, there are systems where leaf material is fairly rare. Uh, that being Arctic systems, right, where trees are not common, and so we don't have many in the way of leaves. We will often find them uh, very, very important in temperate zones. Again, we've been very focused on temperate streams, and they can be very important in tropical streams. 
they can either appear as uh, as we have them in temperate zones where there's a large fall of vent where a lot of material enters suddenly. That can be, let's say, at the beginning of a dry season where trees are, are losing their leaves um, as they prepare for the dry season. There's still deciduous trees in tropical zones. But they can also be more continuous in tropical zones that remain sort of productive year round that have uh, uh, humid and wet conditions year round. Leaf fall will be sort of a continuous process. And because trees are gonna have be growing year round, there will be very limited algal production. And so those streams will be very highly reliant on alachthanus sources. Since these sources are predictable, right, then you will see lots of organisms that have evolved to take advantage of them. All right, so let's get into the life then of a dead leaf. These two organisms on the right are very, very uh, common consumers of leaf material. The one on the bottom is like a sort of ubiquitous uh, organism. And we'll talk about that as we move into the next lecture and the lecture after that, which are both going to be focused on macroinverts. The one in the top right is what we call a giant stonefly. These are quite large. They're found in very high quality streams. They're really cool and they love leaves. They nibble on them all day, all, all the time. And they're big. They're on the order of a few inches long. So they're pretty noticeable. Now, if you're a leaf and you fall into the water, soluble nutrients are gonna leach out almost immediately, right? That's gonna be, it's gonna happen almost instantaneously, say within just a, a couple of days. What's gonna be left after that? Well, there's going to be quite a bit of carbon that's going to be left, like if you pull that up and you dried out that leaf from a stream, you could easily burn it, and that means that there's a lot of carbon in there that's easy to convert into CO2. And bacteria and fungi are going to start to colonize right away uh, as soon as that leaf enters the system, and they're going to start to break down that structure. In addition to that, these things called shredders, which are what are pictured on the right here, are actually going to arrive and they're going to start to rip that leaf up. They're not ripping it up because they, they have some sort of fascination with ripped up leaves. They're ripping it up because they're eating it. And as they're eating that ripped that leaf, pieces of it are being lost, right? They're kind of messy. They're also passing it through their digestive system and it's being broken down and then it'll be released as smaller chunks as it comes out, right? So we're going from CPOM, that sort of ripped up leaf, to FPOM. And that ripping and tearing actually increases surface area substantially, so it allows the leaves to be broken down by bacteria and fungi better. And on top of that, it's converting leaf now into animal biomass. So th these creatures on the right that you're looking at are very, very heavily built from a terrestrial system. So while they may live in a stream, their bodies, if you actually were to sort of estimate how much of their body is related to material within the stream, will be much lower, right? It would be primarily reliant on material from outside the stream. One other thing to keep in mind as we start to think about this is that not all leaves are equal, right? Some leaves you can think of are very tasty. Some leaves are not very tasty. Why would that be the case, right? So on your left, you can see that here's a populus tree, right? And here a caddisfly is gaining about 1.7 milligrams. Now that's uh, not very efficient when you look at how much is actually coming into the system. But you can see on the right that that's substantially more than, or substantially, I should say less, than the the Quercus, the oak leaf that falls in over here. And you can see that that's a seriously more efficient pathway, getting about 2.2% of the energy as opposed to just 0.7% of that, I should say carbon in that case, but that's something to do with the amount of energy in the system, okay? Now you know that plants have lots of different flavors, right? Some people really like the flavor of one type of lettuce and other people like the flavor of other types of lettuce. Some people really enjoy the flavor of a mix, a bag of mixed greens. Some people really don't like that and they like a really crisp romaine leaf, which is a very sort of neutral flavor, but has a lot of crispiness to it, right? That's all very normal. And that's because leaves have different compounds in them. And those different compounds will cause them to be more or less attractive to your taste. But the different compounds are also an indication of a type of material that's in a leaf. Leaves with a lot of compounds that are astringent or bitter are trying to get you not to eat them, right? And that probably suggests they have a lot of useful compounds, whether you can actually eat them or not is something else. Leaves that have very little flavor are probably alerting you that there's not much in there. The plant isn't doing much to protect those leaves because there's probably not much stored in them. So this is going to be true in aquatic systems as well. Aquatic plants, or I should say plants that, uh, in the aquatic system, uh, that are dropping materials into the 
uh, the stream body itself are going to come in all sorts of flavors. Some are going to be more palatable, some will be less. Some will be more palatable to certain species, some less palatable to other species, right? So there will be lots of different adaptations to using different kinds of trees. When we are talking about leaves, we are talking about something very important here that is related to the, the leaf specifically. So something about the quality of that individual leaf. But we're going to zoom out and assume at some level that leaves are all the same. And I want you to understand that when you zoom in and start to, under, to look at this system closer and you start to appreciate that all these are different, then it really does depend on the leaf you're dealing with. And so some forests will be more productive as a result of that. The carbon entering the streams will be more productive than other systems because the carbon entering those systems is harder to break down. And so it doesn't enter organisms as easily. All right. Think about a pine forest, for instance. It, it doesn't matter that pine trees are evergreens primarily. When those pine needles do eventually fall into the water, and they will, they're difficult to consume. Compare that, say, to a maple forest. Maple leaves are often very tasty um, for a lot of organisms, and when those enter the system, they'll get chewed up very, very quickly. The other thing to keep in mind, going back to, car to uh, atomic ratios, is that carbon to nitrogen ratios vary considerably between sources. Really, really low carbon to nitrogen ratios are suggestive of very high food quality resources. There's a lot of nitrogen packed into that product. When you have huge carbon to nitrogen ratios, it means that, car that nitrogen is so rare, right? It's very difficult for organisms to eat that. So carbon to nitrogen ratios in the hundreds are gonna be harder and harder to consume because it's gonna be harder and harder to pick out the nitrogen that you need to actually go about the process of making your body from all of this additional stuff that, while it's useful, is only useful if you can actually build yourself up. So in general, leaves are not a great food source because they tend to have higher carbon and nitrogen resources. As you saw in that prior picture, only a tiny fraction is actually being absorbed. And that's because leaves are, of course, being let lost from the tree, but only after the tree is able to extract the resources it wants, right? So trees don't just lose their leaves willy-nilly in general, unless there's a serious event like a hurricane. They reabsorb all the materials that are useful for them from the leaf, and then they release all the other material that they're not as concerned about. And so evolution has been very conservative about that, and the materials that the trees are actually losing are not terribly important to them. In systems without very, very strong uh, fall periods where lots of leaves are entering, then you can have, say, fresher leaves entering the system, those bright green leaves entering the system. And those are a very different quality than the uh, sort of brown or golden colors that you see that are being dumped into streams. Now, to be fair, though, fresher leaves do not always translate to instantly better growth. Fresher leaves can also have what we call allelopathic compounds. These are compounds that, are, uh, that have evolved to protect the plant leaf from herbivory. So they can do things like reduce uh, growth rate of the of the herbivore. They can make it take longer to eat. They can uh, cause issues related to reproduction. There's all sorts of ways that plants can can attack the things that are attacking them. So allelopathic compounds actually take energy to overcome. And so eating fresher leaves is not always a solution. Sometimes organisms will allow leaves to weather to a degree to lose those compounds. All right, so that is sort of the life cycle of a leaf in a stream, right? It goes from a very uh, large thing that gets ripped into, into smaller and smaller things until it ultimately ends up as DOM. Let's talk about woody debris. So in addition to the actual leaves themselves, trees can fall in. And when trees fall in, they deposit all this nice wood in the system, right? And, and that wood is really important for aquatic system. I also want to be a little bit uh, cautious here. You hear woody debris uh, mentioned in a lot of different ways. It all ultimately comes down to the same thing. You'll hear it called large woody debris, LWD. You'll hear it called coarse woody debris, CWD, or called large organic debris. You'll hear it called um, uh, woody structure. There's all sorts of stuff that it goes by, but I just want you to know that I'm going to call it woody debris. If you hear someone talking about wood and they're using a different terminology for it, they probably mean exactly the same thing as you do. Uh, it just comes out of many different schools of thinking, okay? So don't be intimidated by the range of words that you see. 
What is more than food is the way I would describe it first. It's really an important structural element to streams rather than something that a lot of organisms eat. You already know that it changes things like channel morphology, it has modifications to velocity, it traps sediment, so it modifies the way that materials are broken down the system, it creates habitat. Uh, it is a really, really important component of natural systems. It has been removed in many, 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 many streams because it is difficult. It creates highly complex systems and it is difficult to navigate around. And so humans have been very aggressive in removing wood from streams. And this has occurred in large and small streams. So for instance, the Mississippi, uh, if you read Mark Twain's account of the Mississippi, you will hear about how complex it is to travel up and down the Mississippi. It takes a real talent years of training before you can navigate it without constantly grounding your boat. That has largely been modified, right? If you go up the Mississippi now, it's very easy to just stay in the marked channels. And that's because a lot of that woody material that was making it very difficult for Mark Twain to travel around uh, in the Mississippi was because, and I know his name isn't really Mark Twain, but I'm using it here because it's a common name. Uh, it has been removed so that it, we can transport materials up and down those streams more easily. And that has had profound impacts on these stream systems in a variety of ways. It turns out that eating wood directly is actually fairly rare in aquatic systems. We do occasionally see it. This is a good example of an organism that does eat wood. You can see it has a very modified tooth uh, anatomy that allows it to literally scrape the tree into its mouth. These organisms that tend to be xylophores, which are the sort of tree eaters, right? So that these are the wood eaters, the proper wood eaters, are predominantly found in uh, tropical systems. They are very rarely found uh, much further than temperate systems. And they don't make a large contribution uh, to the food webs where we think about them in our temperate zone, okay? so. Eating wood, it turns out, is very, very difficult. It's very hard to liberate the energy stored inside of woody material. And they actually can't do it directly. They rely on bacteria within their guts to help break down that woody debris so they can actually eat it themselves. Even the ones that do eat wood are often actually eating the surface of the wood because they're trying to collect a lot of uh, fungi and bacteria from that wood. And they're not, let's say, just eating uh, a wood chip. It's not like you can take, go to Home Depot, buy a two by four and feed it to them and they would be able to survive off of that. They really actually need that wood to be conditioned with lots of living uh, organisms, predominantly again, those bacteria and fungi, before they even have a chance to extract enough nutrients to maintain their bodies. So when we talk about wood eaters in aquatic systems, I want you to be a little bit careful here. They're not really like termites in the sense that termites are really able to just eat wood and survive. These organisms are using a more complex pathway to get the energy they need. One thing that you might ask uh, is why is wood eating so rare in aquatic systems? And that would be worth Google searching. Wood is therefore gonna behave very differently than leaves, right? It's gonna have C to N ratios that are extremely high. You can get up to 400 or even higher, right? So that means it's gonna be a really tough source of energy to, to extract materials from because it's gonna be basically all carbon and no nitrogen. So relying upon it is gonna be really risky because it's gonna be hard to meet all the necessary nutrient needs that you have, right? There's also lots of ligands in it, things that are uh, difficult to digest beyond just the, the uh, cellulose. So when wood enters a system, unlike a leaf, which is probably going to be in there for the order of, let's say, days to weeks to months, wood is going to enter a system and it might be there for years to centuries. Okay, So modification of things like the Mississippi River by the removal of wood, even if today we said, okay, from now on, we're just going to let wood enter the Mississippi River naturally and we're not going to do anything else to it. It would take literally thousands of years before that woody material built back up again because it will take that long for wood to be, in a sense, recruited from the landscape. It has to get brought into the aquatic system. It's gonna be fixed in place by all sorts of geomorphology events. And then it's gonna be buried. Some of it's gonna be exposed at different times. More of it's gonna accumulate. It's gonna take a long time to even build up a lot of that woody debris. And ultimately to have the complexity and structure, 
it's going to take that long to do. And if you ever have a chance to go to, say, um, an old growth forest that has never been logged, you'll see this. Old growth forest, to walk around an old growth forest is very difficult. You're going up and down constantly, and you don't go very far because you're constantly going over logs that have fallen down and over tree branches that have fallen down and through stumps and broken pits. And it takes a long time to move anywhere. And when you go to a forest that has been logged, the ground is nice and flat, all the trees have been pulled out, and they've been allowed to regrow. And so most of the forests that you interact with on a day-to-day -day basis are secondary or tertiary. They've regrown at least one or two times uh, since you've seen them uh, because they've been, they were already logged when uh, Europeans first arrived. And even before Europeans arrived, native peoples were having large impacts on the shape and structure of these forests. So I just want you to be aware that these uh, systems are very different than they have been. They are very different than they will be in the future. And they are not so easy as to snap a finger and to recover what we had in the past, all right? So when we get into the restoration the lecture, I want you to start to think about the difficulties of that, right? Somebody says, I want this to look like X. And I say to you, realistically, Right, that might take longer than your family has, let's say, lived in the United States. Right, and that is a that starts to get into time horizons that are very long and very difficult to understand for humans. Another really important contributor to uh, Loch Ness sources in streams are these things: terrestrial insects. Well, there's a lot of insects in and around our world, but a major contributor, in fact, to streams is the the little things like ants dropping on the surface. And in fact, this is so important that there are aquatic insect groups that have evolved to exploit, basically to just exploit terrestrial insects. So a good example of this is water striders. Water striders have evolved to skim around on the surface of the water and pick off terrestrial insects that fall in the water. If you don't believe me, take an ant and throw it into the water and watch how fast water striders spin over to it. Right. They are uh, uh, attracted to disturbances in the surface of the water. Things like struggling insects are exactly what they're looking for. They'll pierce them with what looks like a little tube and then they'll suck the material out of them, sort of like a spider. In addition to that, so insects can be very dependent on other insects. Uh, many stream fishes are very heavily dependent on terrestrial insects. In fact, food webs for some fish can be largely supported on terrestrial insects and people already know this who go fishing with flies because you know that you're frequently tying flies that look like terrestrial insects so clearly the fish are cued in on that uh, terrestrial insect body the other thing to keep in mind is we haven't talked about aquatic insects yet but we're really close to it so i'm going to start to include thoughts about them but aquatic insects live for long periods of time with wings in many cases, and they live in frequently in the terrestrial or in the riparian zone, right? And so they're transporting material out into these systems. But when they're feeding out there or doing something out there and then they're laying eggs back in the aquatic system, they're also bringing these resources back in. So they're interconnecting these systems, and in so doing, they make both systems more productive, okay? So some species eat insects, some lay eggs. Uh, many are in terrestrial zones. They are also getting eaten. So they're, they're helping to make these systems more resilient by linking these systems more closely. Okay, so it can go both directions. Terrestrial insects fall in, but aquatic insects are also going to go out. And just to briefly convince you that aquatic insects can be important, you can see here that spiders in and around a stream can be predominantly uh, fed by aquatic insects. Another major contributor of a Loch Ness sources is, in fact, these guys, the fish. Okay. So fish are a very important contributor of resources to systems themselves, especially ones that are coming well outside the system. So for instance, salmon, when I mentioned these earlier in the beginning of the lecture, are feeding predominantly in the marine system. And so all of that material that they're storing up in the marine system is being transported in from the marine system to these freshwater streams. So these are absolutely allochthonous sources of energy for the stream. Right, and there can be large numbers of salmon. Look at all these fish, right? If all these fish died, and they will, then all of that nitrogen, phosphorus, carbon, uh, calcium, all that material, potentially mercury as a, as a uh, detractor, is going to be deposited from that marine system into this stream system. And then some of it's going to go back downstream, right? Some of those fish that are feeding in stream systems are going to extract resources from the stream, and then they're going to leave that stream and take them with them. Right? And so sometimes 
systems are net uh, exporting. So sometimes the stream is net exporting of material if a lot of little fish survive. And sometimes it's net importing if very few little fish survive and lots of big adult fish come back. And also, this is gonna be very seasonally driven. So there's gonna be periods where lots of resources are being dumped into the system and lots of resources being carried out. And it's gonna be predictable because it's gonna be related to things like water flow and temperature. And so you're gonna have species that are gonna to evolve to take advantage of these systems. Do salmon increase the stream in productivity? And so that's a question. They can export and they can import. Do things like salmon increase the stream's productivity? Well, in fact, they can do that very much. Okay, so here's a great example of that. Um, this shows that uh, things like sculpins are basically entirely reliant on uh, salmon nutrients and are very, very heavily dependent on the, the salmon runs to maintain their population sizes in streams. And it can be more complicated than that, right? It's going to be both and, maybe sometimes, okay? But it certainly does this, it creates resilience where both systems are better linked and because they're better linked, they're both resistant to perturbations because if one system has a large shift, the other one is not likely to have such a large shift. And so organisms can adapt by taking advantage of one system more than the other when things are bad. And the next thing you're gonna say to me if you know anything about fish is, okay, that's fine, but Maryland doesn't have any salmon. So you can show me as many salmon pictures as you want and tell me about how great salmon are, right? These all look delicious. But we probably have not had salmon in Maryland since at least the last ice age, probably much longer than that. But actually Maryland is chock full of species that migrate, okay? And there are a number of species that have been in and around our region. We have all sorts of sturgeons, the top two here, tons of different herrings, which have been really important to our stream system. And we'll cover what these types of fish are when we get to those lectures. We have things like lampreys, we have striped bass, of course, we have uh, white bass and white perch. We have brook trout, which were also uh, migratory. If you've ever been out to a stream and you've thrown a hot dog in at night, you will see lots of eels come out, right? Those are also very migratory. And the other one, this sort of ubiquitous one that people are very familiar with, blue crabs. Blue crabs are very, very migratory, in fact. They move materials around these systems and you will find them in streams in and around Maryland for sure. There are two major life cycles that we have. We have what are called anadromous life cycles, where an organism does the majority of its growing in marine systems, but it does its early life and it's sort of a, a primer in a freshwater. It grows a little bit in the freshwater and then it heads downstream. Sometimes it's in freshwater for a long period of time though, so maybe a couple of years, and then out in a marine system for only a year, but it doesn't matter. The growth is predominantly in that marine system, okay? This is characterized by salmon, but we have another species that do this. Sturgeon do this, herring do this, um, our striped bass do this, uh, uh, our lampreys do this, our brook trout uh, can do this. Okay, so there's a lot of variability in these systems and they all look like this anadromous life cycle. The other life cycle we have is a catadromous life cycle. And we have two groups that do this, the blue crab and the uh, American eel are the most characteristic of that. In these ones, animals lay their eggs in a marine system. They grow a little bit in the marine system, but they usually re-enter the estuary pretty small. Then they do the vast majority of their growing in freshwater, and then they migrate out as adults to go lay their eggs in marine systems again. All right. Again, characterized in our area by eels and by uh, blue crabs. Now, what you may be asking me is why do these animals do this? Right, so if we look at the number of catadromous species, there are catadromous species all over the world, but they're predominantly locked in right here in the tropical to semi-tropical zones, okay? We're on sort of the upper end of that for eels, right? So we're, we're located up here and you can, eels actually do extend all the way up and around like that, but the majority of, of catadromous species are actually located in this much darker band here. If you look at anadromous species, it's actually inverted. It tends to be that animals are predominantly found nearer to the Arctic, right? So it's the inverted version of that, right? So where there's catadromous, there aren't anadromous. Where there are anadromous, there tend not to be as many catadromous. So it's sort of inverted from that. So what drives that? Well, it turns out it's related to ocean productivity. 
when ocean productivity is very, very high, and in regions where you see these dark colors, you can see very high ocean productivity, those tend to be in northern climates. Okay. In tropical regions, it tends to be very low ocean productivity. So catagomous fish do not use those systems to grow in. They use the freshwater systems. At some point, there's some sort of overlap where you could do both, right? And that's what we see in Maryland as a place where there's some overlap. So we have both species, although we tend to have these anadromous systems because we're closer to these highly productive offshore marine habitats, all right? So when people look at a coral reef and they say, oh, it's so beautiful, so productive, understand that coral reefs are like deserts. There's almost no nutrient there. A lot of species are literally starving. They're just dying to get food. Uh, and that is because those systems are not terribly productive. Right. And the really productive systems are actually these cold northern zones that go from really productive summers to strong cold winters back to really productive summers again. And I want to convince you that Maryland actually had a lot of contributions from things like migratory species in its streams for a long period. Right. Migratory species were very common. Whole human societies were dependent on these species migrating into the streams in and around the region to sustain themselves. And so it's only probably been within the last hundred years that people have really that those numbers have really declined and people have really forgotten how important they were. Certainly for the first Europeans who arrived, this is how they survived. Right. They, they would not have been able to to feed themselves if not for migratory fish. They would not have been able to establish the market economy without tobacco, but they would not have been able to survive without migratory fish. And for the native peoples that were here before that, their societies were very in, keyed in on regular migration and the movement and use of these migratory fishes in and around the region. All right. So human societies have, for the majority of time that humans have lived in the bay, been very dependent on these migratory fish. And hence, the stream ecology has been very dependent on the migratory fish. It is only in very recent times, let's say in the last 50 to 100 years, when declines have become so substantial that they no longer move in such large masses that we've forgotten how important these systems were uh, for the streams themselves. Right. These nutrients that they were bringing in would have made the stream systems far, far more productive than they are today. You can do all sorts of fun things uh, to study a lock thinness resources. Here's one I just wanted to show you. I really wanted to go out and do stuff like this, but we can't this summer. Uh, but you can put traps up to exclude, let's say, material coming in or to trap aquatic insects as they go out to measure how many aquatic insects are leaving per se meter squared of habitat. You can do this all over a stream to get good replicate and sample size. Uh, and you can do it with relatively low cost materials, PVCs and, and mosquito netting, right? But there's lots of cool studies to be done looking at how the interaction of terrestrial and aquatic systems in this back and flow of materials can be done. All right, next up, we're going to be doing the macro invert. So I keep showing you pictures of these. And I'm sort of alluding to them. We really need to talk about them now. They're really, really cool. Lots of diversity here.